Well, I did. Um, not sure, really. It depends on what's happening with box changes. Um, so yeah, can... let's. Um, we, we're just going to have to see whether. Uh, he hasn't texted me yet, so. I, uh, I Ian needs to uh, go and do this box change, in which case I will start. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I see Ian's computer that I was going to say, if, if you want, I can just do a little of the intro and housekeeping information while we yeah, sure, uh, yeah. pause and wait. Um, so first, I'd like to welcome everybody to the um, South London Arrhythmia Nurses Forum. Um, just a few, I'm going to, oops, keep letting people in here, which is great, great. Uh, we've just got a few notes of the very typical housekeeping uh, information that we always have is please keep your microphones on mute unless um, you're going to be asking a question, which we will have question and answer um, after this, the sessions. However, you can feel free to add all of your questions into the chat box and we'll try and address those with each session. We are recording, as you may have seen, so if you're if you prefer to have your camera off, please feel free to do so. We will be posting this on our website on the South London Cardiovascular Network's website, so you can um, share with colleagues and also review some of the information. And if you would like to see what other info, uh, what other sessions we've got going on, you can visit our website. It's SLCN, like South London Cardiovascular Networks. NHS.UK. And I'm um, just very delighted to have our speakers here. Uh, I'd like to just give a quick little introduction, if I may. Sabi Naj is a final year EP in devices SPR in the South London Deanery. Um, he completed his PhD studying persistent atrial fibrillation and is an ardent supporter of lifestyle modifications in the treatment of AF and will be speaking with us on that exact subject. And Major Ian Parsons, who's also joining us, is a British Army cardiology doctor and fellow in EP and devices, currently based at St. George's Hospital. Ian has taught and lectured on several topics pertaining to cardiology, both nationally and internationally. His research on heat syncope and exer exertional collapse in the UK Armed Forces has been covered by news outlets around the globe. He's a lecturer in the UK Armed Forces Academic Department of Military Medicine and has published over 40 peer-reviewed papers, abstracts, and book chapters pertaining to cardiology and military medicine. So we are delighted to have you both in as, as our speakers and welcome you and we'll give the floor to you. Take it away. Uh, what we're just discussing is uh, um, Ian uh, may have some uh, uh, clinical responsibilities, but we'll uh, play by ear and and then um, see uh, who can commence. We'll take Ian, first. Uh, I yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll let Ian start in that case, so I'll stop sharing because he might be called away. And then uh, in that case, it's better if uh, I stick around. Stop sharing. And as a reminder, we encourage you to put your questions in the chat and we can address them there or at the end. We're very informal. Excellent. I think you just share. Ian, I think you're on mute. If you, the other thing is, if if you'd prefer to email me the presentation, I can I can link it up for you if you like. He's just uploading it to the PowerPoint oh, okay. live. Okay, Okay, you start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. This yeah, this is just the quirks of uh, clinical duties. Uh, I'm going to start, so I'm going to uh, share my presentation again. Completely understand. And like I say, we're grateful that you're even here. 
No, I mean, as, as I said, whilst the television is loading, I'm really passionate about this subject. The more I, I learned about the mechanisms of persistent atrial fibrillation, the more it became really quite clear that uh, persistent atrial fibrillation is a, is a, is a condition that is, uh, has so many factors contributing to it uh, that it doesn't just get solved on the ablation table indeed. It mostly doesn't get solved in the ablation table. And as you know, your all arrhythmia nurses, um, atrial fibrillation can cause heart failure, can cause stroke, and most importantly, just reduced quality of life as well, um, which is in itself a, uh, a huge issue with any kind of chronic illness uh, such as um, atrial fibrillation. So just as a brief outline, I'll talk about the modifiable risk factors and discuss how they affect atrial fibrillation. But the main goal of the presentation is to um, kind of be able to give your patients empowerment to take management of their condition into their own hands. And that can be really, really difficult to achieve, but you're in an excellent position where you could influence these people's lives. And I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity that, that should not be uh, passed by. And I just hope that I can give you some tools today to, to help you with that and improve your patient's quality of life and just get them into an active and, and most importantly, more enjoyable life. And for many decades, when we talked about atrial fibrillation, we meant anticoagulation, um, heart rate control, or um, just to you know slow down the heart, or uh, medication, or uh, direct current cardioversion. But recently, uh, the the guidance uh, documents have uh, understood that we need to enable patients to to help themselves as well uh, by reducing the behaviours and and the habits that increase the risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And the habits and lifestyle choices that contribute to atrial fibrillation are hugely complex. And what the, this um, figure itself looks very overwhelming for, for the management of the condition. Um, and we do provide a lot of kind of professional-led and uh, care with a lot of medical jargon and, and uh, ablation this, ablation that. Um, but that, remember, is an hour of the patient's uh, life or if they're seen maybe twice a year, it's it's half an hour, an hour of, 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 of their year. And what we want to make sure is that they are trying to cure that illness also when they are not uh, in the hospital, not getting an ablation and not being in a, in, a, in, a, in a hospital environment. And just walking through the slide, um, all these intimidating uh, conditions can be addressed by, by simple intervention. For example, you know, introduction of physical exercise, smoking cessation, and the cutting down or complete stopping of alcohol are very clear goals that almost exclusively lie on the patient's shoulders. And the management of these conditions um, also rely heavily on the interaction between the patients and us. So we need to find that channel where we can communicate to patients in a in a way that that gets through to them, but is not overwhelming. And that is a very difficult balance to get, and it relies on a certain rapport that we have to build up with patients. For example, you know, high cholesterol, very effective, reduced by statins, blood pressure. Uh, and high and uh, type 2 diabetes can be treated by medications. Obstructive sleep apnea uh, can uh, be treating by, treated by CPAP, but also weight loss, daily exercise, and alcohol cessation have an effect on all of these illnesses. 
So although this, looks, this slide looks complicated, very simple interventions such as daily exercise, alcohol cessation, and, um, and weight management can have an effect on all of these. So you need to ask your patients, you know, what can they do, what can I do to uh, improve my quality of life? Well, quitting smoking, I think, is, a, is, is a, an easy one. Everybody knows about that. But that took us something like 50 or 60 years to go through. And that resulted in something like uh, from 30% smoking in the UK and on average, I think we're down to 12. And that's something that definitely kills you. So you can imagine how difficult it is to get through the rest of these interventions, like stopping drinking alcohol, achieving a healthy weight and doing regular uh, physical activity. So for example, with regards to smoking, at the moment, um, Public Health England brought out a guidance document that actually recommends vaping. It doesn't mean you need to take, a bit, take it up as a new habit. It's more as part of a process of quitting nicotine altogether. So even if our patients have, make the uh, simple first choice of going from cigarettes to vaping, they've probably done something for their health. So I'm just going to run through these things day by day, and you will notice how significant misunderstandings exist uh, about alcohol consumption and especially what excessive alcohol consumption is uh, uh, with our patients. And alcohol, unfortunately, is completely ingrained in British and European culture. Uh, but it's quite clear from recent guidance that there's no amount of alcohol that is beneficial at all for health. So gone are the days where we recommended uh, you know, a glass of red wine or whatever. It just, it's just not there. That, that, that data has been refuted. So the government currently uh, recommends keeping alcohol consumption to less than 14 units. And this is for both sexes. So previously, uh, females were allowed less uh, um, and males were allowed more. Um, that has also been refuted by evidence. So this would be, you know, a bottle of red wine is 10 to 12 units or four to five pints of lager or five to six pints of uh, um, ale a week. Uh, and that can't be saved up for the weekend, which is a question that I've had asked before. Um, and although these calorie counts do not appear very high in a, in a pint or in, in wine, consuming alcohol will A, increase patient's appetite and encourage them to overeat. But the second issue with alcohol is that it's considered something called an empty calorie. That means that these calories uh, that we consume in the form of alcohol have absolutely no nutritional value and they go straight to liver mm -hmm. fat. That's how just the, the body deals with the, the detoxification related to alcohol and that's how it, it, it tries to mitigate the harms from alcohol. And that's why it's associated with, with, with fatty liver disease. So it's also been shown that, that alcohols, uh, quitting alcohol is highly beneficial for atrial fibrillation patients. This was the key slide from a study conducted in Australia. Uh, this is an amazing group uh, led by um, a professor called Prashnathan Sanders, who are very, very hot and strong on uh, lifestyle management for atrial fibrillation. And most of the studies and the information that I give you now are from that kind of area. So in this study, uh, they showed that uh, approximately three quarters of people who uh, did not stop drinking had AF come back over a six month uh, observation period, whereas only half of the patients had atrial fibrillation episodes in the group who quit drinking entirely for six months. Now, 75% versus 50%, if I told you that a drug had a 25% absolute risk reduction, uh, that 
we we be millionaires, billionaires from that drug. Nowadays, we're we're uh, trying to get uh, you know two percent, half a percent, one percent absolute risk reductions that we are sold as uh, in the form of relative risk reduction, but. This is a 25% absolute risk reduction in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So in this trial, both groups drank approximately 16 units of alcohol. So that's barely over the tolerated limit set out by the UK government. Yet they achieved a massive uh, result in terms of uh, atrial fibrillation recurrence. The Going on to do the most complex issue is overweight, obesity, and weight loss. As opposed to tobacco and alcohol, we cannot just tell patients not to eat, right? Uh, diet advice is very contentious and is a main theme in many heated debates. And Press Sanders' group, Professor Sanders' group in Australia, uh, has brought out several large, very convincing studies about the benefits of losing weight. And the legacy trial is one of the most important. Ten percent. Just got an error message, so I'm hoping it no my connection is OK. Yeah, we can still hear you. Excellent. OK. So the legacy trials showed that if you're obese, but you manage to lose at least 10% of your body weight, uh, you get significantly better freedom from atrial fibrillation. Of course, in these studies, they all use statistical shenanigans to try and, and correct and only focus on a single thing. Of course, if somebody loses weight, then they're likely to adopt more healthy habits in general. But um, focusing it down onto weight loss, there was a, an amazing result where they said in the weight loss group, atrial fibrillation was six times less likely to return. Now, in this study, uh, this was not done instead of atrial fibrillation ablation. This was done to support atrial fibrillation ablation. And nowadays, with our waiting lists of, of up to a year in most places, especially with COVID, this is a huge opportunity for us to be able to intervene. And of course, the, the uh, healthy uh, cutoff for uh, body mass index, and this is just based on a population average, is 25. If our patients yeah, achieve 25, then, then we know that the, the, the benefit of losing more weight is unlikely to be significant. But for example, in the South Asian population, for, for unknown reasons, uh, 23 is the number to aim for. Uh, South Asian populations, for some reason, develop diabetes and complications uh, at a lower BMI compared to uh, uh, white populations. The NHS has a, an excellent website, which I use frequently in my clinic, uh, to uh, calculate the patient's BMI. Uh, BMI is similar to HbA1c in that if you're patient who suffers with diabetes knows what their HbA1c is, that's an excellent indicator for you to say that the patient knows and wants to take control of their illness and, and, and wants to participate in their care. The same goes for BMI. If the patient knows what their BMI is, then it's you, you already have an in there. So you already um, have a patient who, who wants to participate in their care and is, is, is keeping tabs on numbers. Now, the equation leading to weight loss is quite simple energetically. If you consume more calories than what you use, you put on weight, and if you consume fewer calories, then you lose weight. And if we were simple, obedient, obedient robots without emotions, craving, habits, then the presentation would just stop here and uh, we could just go home. And if we lived in a society where the well-being of individuals was more important than profit margins, we would also have a much easier time. But in the meanwhile, what we have to admit is that weight loss is far more complicated for most of us than just eating less. And 
I would like to emphasize some overarching themes that can lead to your patients feeling that they're in control and potentially achieving sustainable weight loss because it's sustainable weight loss that we want to achieve. And these interventions need to be emphasized to the patient that they take time. Any kind of wonder intervention uh, that promises fast results is, is not going to be sustainable. They take time, research and effort from the part of the patient, mostly from part of the patient, and we need to support them with that. And it takes far more time and far more dedication than just filling a prescription and taking a tablet or nowadays taking an injection. The truth is that medications and interventions that you need uh, need, need you, to, you to put in the extra work and for the patient to put in the extra work. And um, I'm not saying that uh, people shouldn't take their uh, medications to help but they need to participate in their own care. And with regards to calorie consumption, it's about sim making simple changes and, and keeping the changes consistent and sustainable. We know that diets and shakes um, just don't work. Mostly the reason that they don't work is that they impose such significant restrictions on people's lifestyle that people just lose all the benefits after they stop the program. I think it's very important to note that all calories are not equal. And I will talk about this later during the presentation, uh, but it's crucially important to know where your calories come from. Um, interesting facts such as calories consumed in the evening when most of us have our larger meals are, lo are more likely to lead to overweight than calories consumed in the morning and the you know the old adage of breakfast like a king lunch like a prince dinner like a pauper uh, has some uh, relevance even in the, uh, the 21st century and if breakfast is is not you know part of a patient's lifestyle then uh, for example, they can choose a very successful strategy called time-restricted eating, which has been sh uh, shown to be very beneficial, um, especially if the eating window st stops in the afternoon, for example, eating between 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. Unfortunately, big late-night meals in the study that, that assessed time-restricted eating showed that there was a slight elevation in blood pressure with uh, when your eating window is from, say, 12 p.m. or or 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. or 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. But all these dietary uh, interventions eventually lead to weight loss by calorie restriction. Um, it's important to emphasize to the patients as well that it's okay to be human with this and it's okay to cut themselves some slack once, say, once a week. They can allow themselves a, you know, a cheap meal. And I, I frequently tell patients in, in clinic to say, you know, if, if you know that that caramel Cadbury's or whatever is, is your vice, then, then have a bar or half a bar or whatever on Sunday. And then you have something to look forward to. And adhering to exercise has similar basic instructions. Changes need to keep be, uh, need to be kept simple, and goals need to be set that they can fulfill every single day. So, if they don't exercise at all, they shouldn't be starting with a 5k walk. Um, even starting walking one bus stop further than your closest than than the closest bus stop. So, if if they if they're on their way home, getting off. At an earlier bus stop means that they walk three, four hundred meters extra, but they need to do that every day. And any exercise matters, especially when you're when you're not doing anything. So if somebody has a, a very typical lifestyle of getting up, walking to their car, sitting in their car, going to an office, sitting down in the office, driving driving home, then a ten minute walk will be a huge addition to their lifestyle. 
and that's 10 minutes and it doesn't need to be a marathon it doesn't need to be a gym it doesn't require any membership it doesn't require any extra money and it requires that 15 minutes but they need to do that every day so and what they need to understand is that exercise also matters if you're just taking the stairs to the first floor instead of taking the lift or walking to a cafe that you know is two minutes further than your usual spot to get your morning oat latte or whatever. Um, and you need to grasp the opportunity to, to inform the patients about any form of exercise. So, for example, simple things like parking at the back of the supermarket car park rather than at the front will give you extra, extra steps in. And um, it's very important uh, also that you have your 30 minutes of prescribed exercise, but what you do in the remaining 23 and a half hours is just as important for uh, your health. And I would like to elaborate on, on one of the really important bits in, in managing lifestyle and, and, and managing uh, calories is and that's where your calories come from and this is a new particularly interesting emerging field uh, that it, um, with the so-called ultra processed foods and they've been in the media quite a bit in the last say year or so and these ultra processed foods may well be one of the most important driving forces behind the growing problem of uh, overweight and obesity in our society uh, and the United States uh, Nations uh, report was uh, co-authored by uh, this excellent speaker who's on YouTube, if you, if you uh, uh, Google him, I put his name on there, Professor Montero from Brazil. And just put it into Google, put it into YouTube and, and listen to him. He's an excellent speaker and he breaks down the topic extremely well. So... What are ultra processed foods? These are high energy density, high sugar and high salt foods that are easily broken down by the body and converted into energy that is rapidly stored in fat tissue. And the researchers call this uh, uh, hyper palatable. And I think anybody, anyone, all of us can relate to this. If you think back to the last time you opened a packet of chocolates or crisps or biscuits, these are specifically engineered uh, to not be able to, uh, to, so you don't stop it. Let's put it this way. And it's very interesting, the wording that the report used. So the, uh, the report actually defines these products uh, while carefully avoiding the term food. It talks about formulations of industrial ingredients created by techniques and processes. And cooking here is not mentioned at all. The ingredients that the way you can identify ultra processed foods are completely unrecognizable as, as something that you would find in your kitchen cabinet. And the substances used to create the products um, only serve to make the product more sellable, more palatable, with the primary focus being on profit. Uh, in order to te test the effect of processed foods uh, uh, on weight gain and eating habits, there was a 2019 study that divided participants into two groups. Both groups lived in the research uh, facility and were served all their meals by staff. This is a very rare type of trial that uh, requires very rigorous monitoring because it's just in the real life it's it's Im impossible to uh, uh, control what a person will eat. Although the initial servings were matched exactly in calories, sugar, fat and other mac macronutrients and fiber, they were allowed to request further portions. So this was called an ad libitum or free feeding regimen. This was a two week trial. And at the end of the two weeks, the yeah. uh, consumers of the ultra processed diet ate an extra 500 calories. That's basically a meal. 
when they had free access to food, they just overconsumed on the ultra processed foods. Um, for reference, in order to burn 500 kilocalories, you need to walk at a moderate pace for approximately an hour and a half. Um, they also ended up gaining about one kg of body weight, as opposed to the unprocessed group who actually lost about one kg. And these uh, individuals would have started out on something called a standard diet, which is, if you ask me, is a misnomer. There's nothing standard about ultra processed foods. Unfortunately, the UK is a leader in this in Europe. The UK diet uh, contains 56% ultra processed foods. And in the US, where we think people following are following a much unhealthier eating habit, it is only 1% higher at 57%. And for comparison, uh, the average person in France, and you, you'll see that as you, if you travel there, they eat about 30% ultra processed foods. Unfortunately, the uh, numbers are growing there as well. Um, but there is a stark difference between uh, the UK and the US and the rest of Europe. Another interesting piece of information, children's diets all over the high income countries have an even higher proportion of ultra processed foods at 65%. Uh, and that's a UK average. And some children, in especially more socially deprived areas, get their calories with an 80% ultra processed food diet. And I urge you, as well as your patients, to, to, to think about this when you buy your kids uh, uh, treats. The treats and, and sweets and, and whatnot are conditioned. They're an absolutely conditioned uh, um, uh, thing that we tell them that this is nice and we tell them those are treats. So let me show you some examples. There are extremely clever marketing and you, you can use this in your life and, and you can uh, tell your patients that uh, how to spot ultra processed foods. So, you know, start with breakfast. Breakfast cereals are, are, are a particularly bad offender when it comes to processing. So I like porridge, that's what I eat for my breakfast. It's an excellent uh, long chain carbohydrate to start the high, the day with, has a lot of uh, energy that releases over a couple of hours rather than spiking your blood sugar in 10 minutes for it only to plummet at one, two hours after uh, what's uh, making you feel downtrodden and hungry. On the left, you can see what uh, ingredients porridge should have, and that is porridge. The second product in the middle uh, makes the breakfast a bit more palatable uh, um, and they add oat flour, which is a slightly more processed oat. And the government mandate um, says that anything that is flour needs to be fortified with certain vitamins. There's nothing wrong with that. But remember that by grounding it down, the oat flour is much uh, more easily absorbed, absorbed faster, and therefore its glycemic index, i.e. the speed at which it increases blood sugar, and thereby inducing the pancreas to produce a large amount of insulin, is going to be uh, um, far higher. So it will put a far higher uh, onus on the pancreas to push down that blood sugar after it's spiked. So this is a fairly innocuous addition, uh, but this ultra fine oats are far more easy to absorb than say jumbo oats or still cut oats. And on the right, you can see some very clever marketing. And I, I think I just had a uh, conversation with a, with a patient who said, no, I eat healthily. I mean, of course, I, I eat porridge. And he just turned out to have the, I don't know, Quaker honey syrup, whatever, uh, porridge. So on the right, you can see this very clever marketing of what ultra processed uh, porridge looks like. Although the packaging is far better than the one on the left. You can see that it's, it's super healthy, 
if you go into the ingredients, which are cleverly hidden somewhere at the back in very, very small caps, uh, the, the ingredients clearly have added sugar. And the fact that sugar is listed second, remember, means that is the second most prevalent ingredient in the food, milk powder and natural favorite flavoring. However, from the label, you would deduct that this is actually a health product with the mock handwritten front telling you it's high in protein. Uh, 100 gram of, of this last product has 17.6 grams of added sugar and 18.5 grams of protein, which is 360 ca um, um, calories. 100 grams of the first product in comparison has 11 grams of protein. So, you know, seven grams uh, uh, lighter, but not a huge difference. But it has 0 0.9 gram of naturally occurring sugars while providing you with the same amount of calories at 370 calories. Now, I can promise you that consuming 100 gram of porridge is a tough job. It's a large portion, even if it is pre-prepared and soaked overnight. But the last product, you may, be, uh, may even want to go back for a second portion after consuming the 100 grams. So if you like a pot of yogurt with your breakfast porridge and you go down uh, um, uh, to, to, to help it go down, you'll be surprised how difficult it is find to find a yogurt that actually contains, um, well, just yogurt. For example, the first two product labels would lead you to believe that the yogurts are similar. But if you scrutinize the labels, you will see that the second yogurt, yogurt snuck in some pectin. I don't even want to guess where what pectin is and how it's cooked up, but I do know that the only reason that it is put into yogurt is to make it look nicer because normal yogurt separates into whey and yogurt. And some people might find this uh, uncomfortable to look at that liquid that that separates onto the uh, the uh, top of your yogurt is actually completely healthy and fine to uh, to consume, uh, but it's uncomfortable to look at and adding Pectin will likely increase the shelf life of the yogurt and making it look prettier for a longer time. The last two products on the list look very appealing. And in the case of the third one, even healthy uh, uh, um, um, is, is on the label. But even a quick glance will identify the ingredients that just do not belong in fruit and yogurt. They're called fruit yogurts, but the fruit yogurt would be fruit and yogurt, right? Finally, I don't think that anyone will lull themselves into the illusion that they're eating something healthy when they choose the last option. Uh, so in summary, if you want yogurt for breakfast, buy some yogurt and buy some fruit. It will take about extra 20 seconds to prepare the breakfast. And um, I would like to point out that even the most sugary whole fruits, such as grapes or oranges, will be gentle on the blood sugar compared to the added sugar in the two products on the right side. And you can, I will also ask you to just focus on how the ingredients suddenly balloon as you go from left to right. I had to use font that you can barely read. It's because there's, there's so much extra stuff that you would never find in your kitchen cabinet. And then this is one of my favorite topics regarding ultra processed foods because I have one of those. I have a favorite topic in ultra processed foods. It's simple bread. And most products, uh, simple needs to be put on air quotes, unfortunately. And these are engineered products on the right. Uh, the, the engineered products that you can see on the right are very far, far away from a baked bread on the left. Bread should contain wheat, flour, water, and salt. And again, flour, as per government mandates, needs to contain add, uh, um, extra additives. Uh, and while you could argue that this makes it processed, and it is, in this case, these additives serve general public health. The other additives only serve the manufacturers. So by they increase shelf life and they make the product more palatable. So I find the brand village bakery particularly comical in in this because i somehow cannot imagine the village bake a village baker reaching for their emulsifiers as they are kneading their fresh batch while we are tucked away in their in our beds at 4 a.m in the morning another trick that manufacturers use 
is putting codes on product, products rather than spelling out ingredients. So if you have a look at the uh, right-sided product, if I make the effort and transcribe the codes, I had to drop the font sizes significantly more to accommodate all the chemical sounding ingredients that these bread-like products contain. The breads on the right side of the slide also have refined wheat flour instead of wholemeal wheat flour, which is again easier to digest and therefore it will raise blood sugar faster and it is easier to chew, therefore leading to higher consumption. Unfortunately, the reality is that if you have a look at the bread on the left, that will cost five times more than the bread on the right. That's unfortunately un un undoubtedly true. So I would only spend a little time on lunch and dinner. Uh, making your own dinner has a lot of advantages, mainly that you have complete control of the ingredients and uh, the price actually is significantly lower for the same or even better quality food. In the UK, if you're willing to spend the cash, it is surprisingly easy to find non ultra processed ready meals, but you still have to look. If you scrutinize the three products on the left, you can see that although they have quite a few ingredients, uh, surprisingly few of them are ultra processed. The main issue with this product is the salt content. And as we most of the time perceive salt as tasty, and also their calorie content, because fatty foods as uh, cheese create a feeling of satiety without the benefits of a higher protein and more costly ingredients. Uh, as the price drops from the second to the fourth product, you will see that the beef content, for example, is uh, dropping significantly. The salt content is exactly twice as much in products three and four compared to number two. And of course, if you cook yourself, you get to decide how much salt you use. This is particularly important for those people who suffer with high blood pressure as in most individuals, salt intake is directly connected to high blood pressure. The current recommended upper limit in the UK is six grams, but if you have high blood pressure, this should be cut down to two grams a day, and your body actually needs about maybe one and a half grams of salt a day to stay healthy. And you will only need more than this if you if you do competitive sport, uh, sports and you sweat a lot. I will close with a slide from the SIGA organization in France. This is a body that has created a complex classification system for people to recognize ultra processed foods. And I think this is an excellent example uh, with starting off with a whole fruit and finishing with the French equivalent of a McDonald's apple pie you will see that the labeling is inversely connected with the healthfulness of the product. Sadly, as you move to the right, you will recognize more and more foods than you might buy for your children or grandchildren as a healthy snack. I mean, I myself have certainly been guilty of purchasing the bear paw apple candy uh, in the middle of the group uh, for my boy because understandably a little monkey with a, in, a, in green packaging is means that it's super healthy. The, there is a specific problem with dried fruit in that although it's whole fruit, by removing the water, you drastically increase the sugar content. And this leads to tooth decay, but it also leads to, to uh, just excess sugar intake because of the, the reduction of the volume of the food that uh, uh, you're consuming or your patient is consuming. So in summary, lifestyle changes work very well for the treatment and prevention of AF, but we need a consistent, concentrated effort to change habits. Uh, patients and, and, and you as well will need to do some initial research to get off to a start, but once you have identified a specific intervention that will work best for your patient, uh, you also need to have a basic understanding of uh, the patient's uh, calorie intake. And this requires a certain rapport with the patient. This requires that extra connection for them to understand that 
lying about this does not serve anybody. And, you know, services like crash diets, diet shakes, they, they don't work. In the first study that I mentioned to you in the legacy trial, to prove the point, the investigators used uh, Nestle sachets in people who were unable to uh, lose weight in the, in the first six weeks. Uh, but that was a trial. A trial is there to prove a certain point. And a trial is there to tell us what we should be doing. But then what, we, what we're actually doing is something different entirely. So these changes, in summary, are really, really not easy, but they're definitely worth it in the long run. And healthy weight will help maintain our patients live an active life for longer. And it will let them choose what they want to do that uh, other than letting their limits be defined by their poor lifestyle choices and the illnesses, including atrial fibrillation, that uh, emanates from that. So thank you very much for listening, and I would like to receive all your questions. Hopefully you have loads, because Ian is not back yet. <laughs> thank you so much for that eye-opening uh, presentation. It's really quite fascinating and a little <laughs> shocking, to be honest. Um, to all of our attendees, please feel free to either raise your electronic hand or type a question or comment into the chat so that we can um, have a, a, a nice little discussion on this. It, there's, I'm sure, quite a, a lot of points that we could cover from, from that. Thank you so much, Savvy. And... While we're just waiting for any questions or comments, um, I just want to remind you that the next session that we'll be holding will be a joint ICC and arrhythmia nurse forum, and it'll be looking at genetics and arrhythmias. Um, although we don't have the date confirmed, we're looking at June or July or so. Um, if you do have any topics that you'd like to see covered at this session, the uh, the session that that joint session that we'll be having, please feel free to email Joe Wood, who was the one who organized this one. And I see, it looks like we've got a hand. Sue, would you like to go ahead? Hi, thanks for that amazing talk. Really, really interesting. Uh, definitely eye-opening and definitely food for thought. Um, but how do you get people to change to change their lifestyles? I mean, you know, sometimes we, we can, you know, obviously we don't just want to bore people into saying you must change your lifestyle. How, how can we, yeah, how can we encourage people? to make those so, changes? Um, I think the uh, it, it's it, it's a very difficult uh, one because um, clearly it hasn't been working. Um, people have been getting more unhealthy and, and uh, the generation is growing up. Um, it, it is said that they will be the first generation to have a shorter lifespan thanks to obesity and, and overweight and, and uh, uh, these uh, lifestyle problems than the previous generation for ages. So, you know, life expectancy has been going up really, really well. And and we, we might be hitting a plateau because of uh, industry trying to uh, get profits. What I've uh, noticed is that um, you, we cannot overwhelm patients. So if, if somebody comes in with a BMI, of, we've never measured their BMI, and you put their numbers into the BMI calculator as I uh, as I do in the NHS app, uh, I just pull it up on the on, uh, during clinic, and it says you know 33, and you have I don't know 25 kg to lose to get to 25. The important thing that's very overwhelming, right? They say, oh, well, why bother? Uh, why would I um, try this if it if if it never works? I've tried so many diets, and then what I try to uh, do is the cheat day um, message I, and I try to uh, uh, um, identify one thing in clinic that they can change so what most people don't understand for example the the, the biggest uh, issue that I think because most people can identify a vice they know that their celebrations or their Cadbury's or their whatever's is not 
uh, is, is not healthy. But for example, bread is, is a very, very interesting one because they'd say, oh, well, it's brown bread. And they don't understand that, that brown bread is, is malted bread. Malt, they use malt to make it brown. It's not healthier, most of it. Um, so one, uh, taking it one by one. Uh, so the, the most surprising thing that people find is is uh, what, how their alcohol consumption, what their alcohol consumption is. So I, I don't drink much. And then how, how many of us leave it there? I'm, a, I'm just a social drinker. Yeah, but what does that mean? I mean, I myself have never been able to drink more than two to three pints. But social drinking here in the UK <laughs> can be up to seven, eight pints on a Saturday and then maybe on a Sunday. And then if it's Friday, that's all, almost the weekend. So why not? Uh, so uh, what I found is is a gradual change, uh, meaning okay, and and very specific changes. So, uh, so you you borrow around and you find one thing in clinic, and that's your you know twenty minutes or thirty minutes uh, the appointment, and you say okay, so you 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 and your wife drink uh, two bottles of wine a week. What if that were one bottle of wine? What if if what if you had three days? Uh, uh, during the weekdays where, you're, where you do not drink at all. That doesn't mean that you take away a significant part of their life or their lifestyle. It means that they're still doing what they want to do. But if they start seeing results, and they will start seeing results, I can promise you that if somebody's drinking two bottles of wine over the week and they cut down to one bottle of wine a week, which just means a smaller glass, then they will experience weight loss. They will experience better sleep. And it's very rare that people will, will uh, rush to go back to drinking those two bottles of wine. So I'm not sure whether, whether this strategy is, works um, because that remains to be tested. But I think uh, identifying a single issue that, that can be changed rather than, than drastically cut uh, may have that effect where that can snowball. So if they start feeling better, then they say, hang on, so maybe if I get off earlier on from the bus, then, then that can add a bit of extra and then I can feel better. Um, the biggest benefit, and this is where I uh, create a very clever segue into the... Uh, Ian Stalk has just appeared, uh, still in scrub caps, is uh, that is, for example, exercise. The biggest benefit you gain from exercise is from no exercise to some exercise. If you already run, you know, two 5Ks a week, if you add in another 5K, you are not going to get the same benefit as, as if you, uh, you are completely sedentary. And you, start, and, and you start walking to the bus stop or you start walking to the train station. So that's, that's, the, that's the answer I would give. Very small changes. And uh, don't try to do uh, what I've done, thankfully only once, is completely anger your patient by, uh, by uh, dropping too much on them. Thank you for that. Thanks for the question, too. Do we have any other comments or questions, actually, before? It sounds like Ian is, is prepped. I just want to see if there's there are any other questions or comments that we want to take on this. I did not know that about malt bread. That's, again, something to take away from my for myself. Nikki, would you like to go ahead? Hi. Um, that was really interesting. But one of, one of the things that some of my patients are doing at the moment is they're replacing alcohol with the zero percent and the 0.5 percent is that frowned upon or is is that beneficial what what's your view so the uh, the problem with the zero percent beer is that the the carbohydrate and calorie content uh, um, and does not change much uh, and it so you're st still getting the calories in uh, but I think quitting alcohol is, a, is is already a huge thing. So what the other I think nurses are probably much better at this than 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 we doctors are is is commending your patient when they when they actually do something that is is good for them. So I frequently tell patients, you know, 
uh, that you know you stop the alcohol. That's an absolutely amazing feat that men that many people cannot do, and you should be proud of yourself. Because uh, sometimes it's it's or well, most of the time in the UK it's social pressure, right? And also I, I've I've met. I, I've met a patient who told me just very honestly, you know, that's that's my only social interaction. Otherwise, I'm, I'm stuck at home. If I don't have a pint or two or five with my friends over the weekend, then I don't go out. And that's very sad. But I think that's where the zero percent uh, drinks are coming in. And although they have a high sugar content, uh, I think people should be commended for for making that first choice. I, I would consider that a similar thing from uh, cigarettes to vaping, which va vaping is a is a quick delivery of nicotine, uh, and if it's a if it's a regulated uh, vaping solution, then it contains very clean nicotine, which is uh, actually not the uh, harmful agent in cigarettes. Nicotine is a direct neurotoxin, so if, if somebody's nicotine naive, they can be killed by nicotine easily. Uh, but if somebody who's who's uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so if, if somebody's you. accustomed to nicotine, then they will uh, um, they, they they will do very well to transfer from cigarettes to vaping. Thank you. Thanks for that. Great. Really appreciate the talk. Ian, looks like you're ready to go then too. Take it away. Can you see everything? Excellent. Yeah. Good segue. Excellent segue. Um, I don't actually know what Sabi presented, but I've I've got a fairly good idea because we're both um we're both very interested in lifestyle measures because I just think it's done very badly and. Um, Partly just because we're just not very well set up. Certainly, I think from the doctor's perspective, we do it very badly. Because I just don't think the way the clinics and things are set up that we we really have enough time to sort of go into detail. And really, I mean, there should sort of be a, a cardiac rehab, cardiac sort of dietetic specifically. I think for um, specifically for for atrial fibrillation, really, um, be my personal view and. I think some of the data that we can show you is really is it would demonstrate how beneficial it would be um, in and certainly in, in where I don't know what the waiting list is in your hospitals, but for atrial fibrillation where we are, it's over a year now for and by the time you sort of get there, all the paroxysmals are persistent and it's just a, a much harder way to keep them in sinus rhythm. So hopefully I can convince you of some of the data um, surrounding exercise. So this is what we're going to try and cover. Um, so we'll have a very brief discussion about exercise causing atrial fibrillation. Um, and then we'll talk about how exercise can prevent atrial fibrillation paradoxically. And then we'll use we'll talk about whether or not you can, can treat it. And then we'll, we'll discuss some of the mechanisms involved. And then we'll see. We'll talk about strategies. And, and really, that's it's kind of open to you as well. That's an open forum because I don't know the answer to that. So does exercise cause atrial fibrillation? Well, I think we probably all have seen that that is the case in, in few people, few people. And really, you have to be exercising fairly vigorously. This was the first study, I think, that demonstrated that I can find. It was, it was in 1998 in the BMJ, and they looked at veteran orienteer runners in the 80s and it was a sort of questionnaire based thing on whether or not they had um, atrial fibrillation but they sort of did some statistics and they found that it was much more common in these very endurance athlete orienteers in Scandinavia and but since then it has been demonstrated in numerous studies so for people who vigorously exercise and you really have to be a fairly vigorous exercise that you you are slightly more prone to get atrial fibrillation and this was a, a systematic review that sort of looked at it around 13 studies mostly sort of cohort and case control studies but it had a, a large pooled sample size of about 70,000 
um, which around 7,000 were athletes. And actually, the odds ratio, odds ratio is I always find it quite difficult to interpret, to be honest. Um, you know, what does that mean, a sort of odds ratio of 2.5, you know? Um, but um, you do have a significant e increased risk. And if you look at this sort of this plot on the side here, everything to the right is, is an increased risk. And those are your sort of confidence intervals there, so they're quite wide. And if they're sort of to the right of this line here, you can say that they're sort of significant. If they cross the line, then um, they're not significant. But when you sort of pull all that data together and analyze it, the odds ratio is around about 2.5. And as you can see, there's sort of less so here. This is just looking at athletes. So just looking at people who are very fit. It seems, again, slightly paradoxically for me, that actually it's younger people, younger athletes, so less than 55, who are more at risk. You think as you sort of get older and exercise, you, you'd compound that risk, but that's not the case. Um, it's actually sort of younger people, and I don't know whether or not that's sort of reflected in your um, clinical experience, but I think it's probably mostly reflected in mine in the few that we do see, the athletes that we do see with atrial fibrillation, or the sort of endurance athletes that we see with atrial fibrillation. So it tends to happen at a younger age. And if you sort of take out um, type 2 diabetes and hypertension, um, it is only significant. The etiology of it, so why do these athletes get it? My personal sort of feeling about this is that it's mostly due to structural remodeling, which is probably some sort of mild cardiomyopathic process in relation to the exercise, because it just doesn't quite make sense how some people would have it and some people wouldn't. That's generally my view. Some people have talked about increased um, ectopic beats. Um, I don't think that's true um, particularly, and I don't think that's held up by the data. This autonomic shift, because obviously you get a massive increase in your autonomic tone when you're that sort of fit um, with, with, with changes of the atrial refractory period, I'm not sure is true. I, I think it probably is. And, and all these people tend to have quite significant atrial dilatation. And I think there is a sort of stretch associated with that. So that's my sort of general feeling, but more, more data needs to be, um, more studies need to be done to sort of unpick this about why this happens. So now that we've sort of got that one out of the way, so in very few people, exercise, very vigorous exercise over a long period of time can cause atrial fibrillation, but that is not the vast majority of what we see. It's not the vast majority of our day-to-day -day work. So really, um, uh, you can put that one to bed. And now we'll talk about how exercise can prevent atrial fibrillation. So this was a study, a retrospective cohort study of 70,000 patients uh, done in America. And they all sort of had a treadmill stress test in Detroit, lovely place, uh, between 1991 and 2009. So it was over a long period of time. And they excluded anyone who had atrial arrhythmia or heart failure, atrial flutter, anything like that. So they, they were generally fairly well people. And they had a final sample size of about 65,000. And the primary outcome measure they looked at was the new onset atrial fibrillation over time. And they were able to ascertain whether or not this was the case because of this sort of American system where um, if you sort of have a claim for atrial fibrillation, then it sort of pings that way. So that's how they were sort of able to establish over time whether or not that people did end up developing atrial fibrillation. And anyone who developed isolated atrial flutter, they excluded. Um, and what they sort of did, am I missing a slide there? No. What, we, what they did was they sort of split it into um, how well people did on that original treadmill test. And we'll come on to what METs are in a minute, but essentially it's a metabolic equivalent um, where one MET is you sat here right now listening to me and sort of 11 METs is running at about seven miles an hour and sort of it's sort of everything in between. Uh, and I'll sort of go through that in a little bit more detail shortly just because it's quite it's used quite a lot in this sort of exercise literature. So they sort of divided these up into what people achieved on the first exercise test, how sort of fit they were initially. And then, and you can sort of see that those who were sort of under six mets, six mets is sort of, I don't know, it's kind of like mowing your lawn. Um, so people who couldn't achieve sort of achieve that, 
uh, 6 to 9 Mets is sort of like fast walking and 10 to 11 is a bit of jogging and more than 11 is, is running, essentially. And you can sort of see that in every single possible um, thing that you measure, hypertension, diabetes, um, you know, any sort of medications, it was all, you know, significantly sort of swayed more towards this one to the, to the less than six and it got less as they sort of got fitter. So already there's a huge disparity there across the groups. And then they looked at the probability of you sort of developing atrial fibrillation over time. And you can see um, that if you're in the lowest risk group, which is this one here, it, it was much increased. And if you're in the if you're in the the uh, greater than 11 group, then your chances were much less over time. This is over a sort of 10 year period here. OK, so a quick talk about metabolic equivalent because it's sort of quite relevant to everything else that we're doing. So it's a metabolic equivalent of task is a measure of the ratio of the rate at which a person expends energy relative to their mass while performing a specific activity compared to a reference. And the reference they usually use is someone just sat there at rest, not doing anything. And that's one met. So we're all sort of around about one met uh, as we are now. And that's it's sort of it has a, a comparability with VO2 max. If you've heard that term before, um, so it's the amount of sort of oxygen uptake per kilogram per minute. Um, and how much energy you expend um, doing that. So two Mets is sort of twice that. So and three Mets would be three times that. So walking three miles an hour is about five Mets, biking eight Mets, that sort of thing. Um, jumping rope, 11 Mets. And someone has actually sort of gone through, uh, this is again an older study, it's sort of gone through and worked out the metabolic equivalence of doing almost everything, which I've included some of them here. So yes, yeah, so doing the dishes would be sort of three, uh, but pushing the lawnmower would be sort of five. And then you've got sort of biking at nine miles an hour. Golf depends whether or not you carry your clubs or take the trolley. Um, and then sort of jogging six miles per hour, you know, which which isn't particularly fast, but um, it's still around about nine mets. And running at 13 miles, running at seven and a half minute miles or about eight miles an hour is 13 Mets. And that's just something I want to raise. Remember that sort of figure of 13 Mets because it becomes a bit relevant a bit further on. And what they worked out was a sort of dose dependent relationship. This is a regression curve, which they sort of calculated. They looked at specific points. So four Mets, 10 Mets and 13 Mets and everything else here over this side of the line has been sort of calculated by the curve. So it's a bit less accurate. And that's why you can see this, these are the sort of confidence limits about how confident they are of that figure. And they get a bit wider as it goes out. But what you can sort of see that for every one Met you are fitter um, at that initial point, at that initial exercise test, the risk of you developing atrial fibrillation was reduced by 7%. So the fitter you are to start with, the less chance you are of having atrial fibrillation. Hopefully I've convinced you of that with this. But we don't tend to see people who are fit and well. Um, we tend to see people with disease. And so what do we do when they already have atrial fibrillation is much more relevant to us as clinicians. So can we actually use exercise to treat um, atrial fibrillation? Well, yes, we probably can. So this was a study called the CardioFit study, and there's a very recent study that's come out that I'll come on to. Uh, this one, I think, was about 2015. So they took people with symptomatic atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal persistent, and they all had a BMI over 27, um, but they could undergo exercise stress, stress testing at baseline. And they generally thought that, number one, a preserved cardiovascular fitness at baseline in overweight AF patients offsets the detrimental effects of obesity. And they also thought that any gain in, in fitness through a structured exercise program would have a synergistic effect with the weight loss on overall freedom from AF. And what, how they did it was they looked at sort of risk factor management and then they took participation in a tailored exercise program. They did exercise testing before and after. And then they assessed whether or not they had AF control using a seven day halter and a questionnaire. And 
what did they find? Well, they managed once they'd gone through this sort of exclusion criteria of getting a sort of final cohort of about 308. And then again, they split these into people with a, a low or an adequate or high. And then they looked at the gain in their cardiovascular function following um, them being going through the exercise program. Actually, the groups here were very well matched. So you can sort of see there's, there's very little difference between the groups um, in terms of those who had a low, adequate or high baseline cardiovascular fitness. The only sort of slight trend there is, is on an echocardiographic measure of, of how well the heart relaxes, um, which is the E to E prime. And that was sort of close to significant there. And again, these are some more death by Kaplan Meyer curves here. But um, again, what you could see on the so these are the ones who are sort of the the fittest, and then these are the less fit. And then you look at how well they do ablation free, drug free, AF freedom over follow up of, of this time, and you can you can easily see the split there. And again, the total AF freedom again, easy, very easy to see the split there. So. Baseline cardiovascular fitness, exactly going along with what that study was before, is going. It was much better in terms of if you had atrial fibrillation, how well you did over time. So those who are fitter did better over time. But could we make them fitter? Well, yes, of course you can, because you can exercise them even though they've got the atrial fibrillation. And they looked at and see who had a, a two met gain. So those who were able to improve their ability to be able to exercise by two mets. Those who had less than a two-met gain and those who had a greater than two-met gain. And those who had a greater than two-met gain, so those that got fitter, um, actually did much better as well. Uh, so if you were able, if you had a baseline cardiovascular fitness that was high, but also managed to achieve a two-met gain, you did even better. But that was the case for anyone. Anyone who was able to get fitter, they did better. And then when you sort of look at, th this was quite nice as well, because you, you were able to sort of differentiate the effects of weight loss and fitness, because you can sort of see that even with those who didn't really lose weight, but actually still gained fitness, they still did better. So it shows you that exercise in itself is not just about the weight loss. It's actually about something about the exercise itself that does something. So whilst they go together, they're complementary, of course, one can lead to the other. Um, although not necessarily, we would advise that people, and that's often the sort of excuse that we get in clinic, oh, I can't exercise because my knee hurts or this and that. But actually, I think, you know, as probably Sabi touched on, most of, of, of losing weight is not about exercise, although it, it will certainly complement things. But you can see that actually exercise does actually have a role in and itself. And this was a study that was literally just published in April of this year, so literally just come out, which was a randomized trial. So they either had the exercise intervention or they didn't. And they randomized 120 patients, again, with paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. And the outcome was whether or not they had AF recurrence off any drugs and without catheter ablation. And they also looked at symptom scores. And by 12 months, in the ones who were exercised, uh, they were free from 24, so 40 percent were free from AF as opposed to 20 percent of the ones in the control group. So that doubles your freedom of atrial fibrillation. You will double it just by making putting them through a tailored exercise program, which is I think is pretty incredible. And it's amazing that we're not really doing this and their symptoms are better. And this difference persisted at 12 months of follow up. So I think it really is a very effective way of controlling atrial fibrillation exercise. Why? What are the mechanisms involved? Well, there are several sort of um, different theories. They're probably not just one. Um, as you could sort of see on that first slide that I showed you, which looked at the sort of differences in cardiovascular fitness and the ones who are much fitter had much lower blood pressure. They had lower, better glycemic control if they were diabetic. They had lower inflammation. Everything was better. They, they took less tablets. So I think there's certainly 
something to do with that. There's a, there's a modification of risk factors, which we know sort of drives atrial fibrillation. You know, visceral fat will decrease, glycemic control will increase, blood pressure control will, will, will improve. So all these things will drive um, improvements. But also with exercise, you do get an improvement in diastolic function. And that, I think that's the real driver because in the vast majority of our patients, they're hypertensive, they have a high left ventricular end diastolic pressure often, or higher left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And that causes, you know, an increase in left atrial pressure, and that's how the left atrium dilates and, and becomes uh, scarred. And but there's there's numerous drivers, I think. And I, I don't think it's one thing. I think it's it's a, a combination of many things. And then, what's the sort of optimum? How much should we say to exercise? It's very easy to say exercise, but you know how much, and. Um, of course, there's always the chance that people get a bit, uh, very occasionally, they become a bit obsessive and they go too much. And and, um, and and we've seen in the beginning slides what that can lead to as well. So they say you should do around about 1,000 to 1,500 met minutes per week, which works out at around about 220 minutes of moderate intensity, which is essentially just brisk walking, four and a half mets activity per week. And that's about 1,000 met minutes. If you just did, just were to do that, so if you went for sort of a brisk walk uh, for 220 minutes per week, however you want to divide that up, that is sufficient enough to be um, considered to be a decent amount of exercise, which will induce a change. So you don't have to sort of suddenly start hitting the treadmill. You don't have to suddenly, um, you know, become Mr. Motivator. Um, it, it really is as simple as that. So um, I think moderate exercise, I hopefully I've shown you that moderate exercise is beneficial in preventing atrial fibrillation. It's great in managing patients with paroxysmal and persistent atrial fibrillation. Um, now, where that the differentiating line between it causing um, atrial fibrillation and it curing atrial fibrillation is probably around about 12 to 13 mets. Um, but it, it can be much higher than that, up to 30 mets. And that's sort of what you see. But there is no real benefit of exercise above 12 mets. So above sort of running at seven and a half miles an hour, there is no benefit. There is no cardiovascular benefit. There's no benefit whatsoever. So really, that's all we need to be able to tell our patients. You just need to be able to walk for 220 minutes a week at four and a half mets. So that's it. Just a brisk walk for 220 minutes a week and things will improve for you. Now, how can we implant strategies to be able to improve patient outcomes? That's what it all comes down to, really. That's the crux of things. Um, because it's very easy to say that. Um, how, but how do we as the team, how do we, how are we able to do that? We all look like this, don't we? So I, I wanted to sort of finish with a case. This is a patient I saw in clinic uh, this week. I, I spoke to her on the phone, actually, in clinic, because we're still doing a lot of that. Now, she's 167 kilograms and she's 167 centimetres, which puts her BMI at around about 60. And her basal metabolic rate, so how many calories she needs to be able to maintain her weight, is about 2,734 per day. You can sort of work that out, um, which is a fair amount um, for a woman particularly. And she's sort of yo-yo dieted for the last 40 years. Um, I think she had some sort of psychological eating problems, particularly because of sort of problems with her mother when she was very young. Um, and then she sort of went anorexic and then had, had sort of had weight gain with children and then her diet sort of yo-yoed. And but she's the, the trend is that she's increasingly put on weight. Now, she's come very symptomatic with atrial fibrillation. Um, incredibly symptomatic, but has been able to manage to be cardioverted to sinus rhythm by our nurses here at George's uh, with the benefit of amiodarone, and she's now currently held in sinus rhythm. Now, the new NHS guidance would suggest that we shouldn't really be ablating anyone under uh, with a BMI over 35, was it 40? <coughs> with a BMI over 40. Now, if this lady had about a 1,000 calorie deficit, for two years, she would drop to a normal weight. And she would only need to maintain a 1,000 calorie deficit. 
um, which would be easy to begin with, but it would get harder and harder as, as she goes on, and she may need to sort of increase her exercise to be able to match that. But at the minute, she's hypertensive, she's got sleep apnea, she's got left ventricular hypertrophy, and there's no way anyone's going to ablate her uh, with a BMI of 60. So what do we do for this lady? How can we help this lady um, who is 55 um, uh, in, in sort of maintaining sinus rhythm and also probably proceeding towards an ablation in the future, which I, I think kind of um, ties together what Zabi and I were have, have hopefully talked talked you through. And I'm, I'm, I don't have the answers really. Um, for me, it was sort of a load of banal statements saying, "Yeah, we need to increase your exercise. You need to lose weight," uh, which he's heard thousands of times before. And you know, the only great idea I had was to refer to bariatric services. Um, which I think is certainly um, should be considered with that BMI. But I don't have any other great ideas about how to manage these people. I mean, ideally, I think we should have a structured exercise program that we could offer these people, you know, structured, managed, like they have in the trials, um, that we can offer our patients, but it just doesn't exist. Or maybe we should sort of open up and expand cardiac rehab, but I, I don't have any other ideas. Um, some people do manage once you sort of tell them what they need to do. They, they do manage to sort of turn their life around, um, but that's not the majority. Um, I think most people just slip into old habits and they continue. Um, and that seems the majority of patients that I see, for sure. So um, this is what we discussed. Um, hopefully I, I've shown you that exercise can cause atrial fibrillation, but only in very extremes. But it is fantastic at preventing and treating atrial fibrillation. We've had a little talk about the mechanisms involved, and I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can implement strategies to improve outcomes. Okay. Thanks, Ian. That was very interesting. Really encouraged you to uh, get off the couch. <laughs> Just wanted to see if we had any questions, comments, any points of discussion from our attendees. Feel free to, like I say, raise your electronic hand or just type it in the chat if you'd like. No, I'm not me. And as I say, just as a, a reminder too, the next forum will be a joint ICC and arrhythmia forum focused on genetics and arrhythmias in June or July. So if you do Absolutely. want to, um, if you've got any topics you'd like to see covered, please email Joe Wood. Do we have I, mean, any? I would like to. Yep, sorry. Uh, it's, sorry, I just wanted to make one um, remark as we both the and I are nearing well, I'm a bit nearer to consultant than Ian is, but I would love to work with, with dedicated um, specialist nurses and advanced clinical practitioners to set up uh, comprehensive and holistic AF clinics where we look after patients and and not just a, an ablation line and a rhythm disturbance, because these these interventions are I, I would hazard to say just as important or in some people more important uh, than than putting them on the ablation table. And there there is a business case to be made somewhere that if we are able to save a repeat ablation that can easily fund dietitians and specialist nurses, um, only if our trusts have that extra vision to see what we can do with that extra money. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that and whether you'd be uh, interested to get involved in something like that and whether you'd be interested to branch out uh, as an arrhythmia specialist nurse or as a cardiac specialist nurse to more uh, holistic treatment of, of, of arrhythmia. Great. Yeah, looks, I echo that. I was going to say, it looks like uh, we've got a comment from Sue, and then also Carolyn has a comment in the chat. 
I, yeah, absolutely. I'd be really interested in something like that. I mean, but don't you think, I mean, as, as a joined up service within the NHS, we're, we're, we're putting the cart before the horse with so many conditions, you know, we should be promoting health rather than treating ill health for, for multiple conditions. You know, not just AF, but absolutely, I think this is this is paramount for our patients. I mean, I think that's true, isn't it? For for all of the problems that we see, a lot uh, well, certainly a lot of the problems we see in cardiology um, is that you know, 20 years ago, um, lifestyles were altered, then perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation that where we are now. But um, hopefully, what we've demonstrated is that even if you have got the disease, it can still, with these lifestyle measures, you can still massively affect outcome. And I completely echo Zabi's point that, you know, we shouldn't just be seen as ablation doctors who, you know, sees a patient who has atrial fibrillation, recommends an ablation, performs the ablation, sees them again. Yes, ablation managed, discharge. Um, because I think that's just missing such a huge trick um but again it's it it just seems as though it's an uphill battle in today's nhs for sure to be able to do that and uh, just one addition to nikki's question in in uh, uh who specifically I, I think it was uh, uh her who asked about you know what advice can we give patients and i think i i did not emphasize enough the comment that ian made during his presentation um, that uh, the the easy summary is that uh, you cannot outrun a bad diet. So when we were talking about simple interventions, if you want to choose, um, choose food and choose changing your eating habits because it just takes so much effort to exercise off that donut is it's just too much. Our body is evolved to to store energy because we were at the brink of starvation for the better part of 100,000 years. That's not going to change. Um, and the companies that are after profit are not going to change. So we need to make our patients more savvy. Uh, and they're not. I mean, I was at Costco the other day fascinating place if you ever go and um i smell this really delicious pizza um and they have this sort of canteen here and you buy a slice of pizza there for like two quid nothing or three quid something like that it has 850 calories in one slice of pizza 850 calories and to, to exercise 850 calories you would need to run at about seven and a half miles every minute for probably around about six or seven, eight miles, it, which would take most people the best part of an hour. And that's ridiculous. You know, there's no way that you can burn off. And if you're having two slices, you're, you're done for the day. You know, that's that's your calorific intake for the day. And you, you see people just eating the whole pizza and it's just, it's wild. You know, the amount of calories that you can eat in such a small sitting is unbelievable um so it has to be diet and it's really difficult to be able to educate people with regards to that because the first thing we always hear in clinic is oh my knees hurt or i haven't really got out and exercise that's why or um, my dog died whatever uh, but that's just it's just not how we, we should definitely be pushing diet first but it's incredibly difficult yeah, I think that there's an easy answer to, uh, unfortunately, there's an easy answer to a patient who says, uh, but I, I can't lose weight because I can't move and I've got the AF. And, um, you know, it doesn't need to be a, a snarky comment, but uh, they, they need to understand the message that um, going out for that 10 minute walk is not going to offset all the colorful packaging that they have in the uh, in the pantry uh, and all the pre-prepared food that they have in their fridge yeah thanks so for i that. think we've captured the message 
I was going to say, I, I wonder if, if that is an element too sometimes of patients being, if they do have an AF diagnosis, if they are um, not confident or in fact scared even to raise their, their heart rates too much and if that's seen and if there's a way around that too. Yeah, I think that reassurance has to come from us. Um, when I say us, I mean a collective us to say, no, it's perfectly safe. You know, you're on tablets to control the high rates anyway. And actually, it's really effective and, and tell them the data that it is. You know, even if you don't manage to lose weight, just exercising will benefit you. Um, so tell them to get out if they can do it. You know, um, if they can lose weight as well, even better, you know. Um, and I think you know, people I think people do have a sort of psychological relationship with food a lot of the time. People do eat because they're they're bored, they eat because they're depressed, they eat because they don't have anything else going on in their lives a lot of the time. And um I, I think it's really difficult to break that, you know. Um I think that's true for younger people as well as people in sort of middle middle age and older people too. Um and yeah, there's no easy answer to that because it's endemic in the Western world. On, on a slightly positive note, I can say that in the there are quite a bit of changes going on in the commissioning of specialized services, which you may or may not be aware of. Um, commissioning has been delegated from NHS England, of specialized services, I should say, from NHS England to ICBs or Integrated Care Boards, Integrated Care Systems. And there is a push, especially in South London, um, that is really taking steam and acceleration to for the shifts to the left to really address the prevention agenda and what they're going to what they're looking at of course is now in a cardio met, uh, metabolic way metabolic way i can't say that word <laughs> where we're addressing you know everyone who has risk of cardiac stroke diabetes and renal because of course getting that prevention you know the the earlier stuff is is really key to avoiding um, admission to hospitals and and secondary and tertiary care. Uh, there, there's one service that is currently available, and uh, that's the diabetes prevention program. And uh, if uh, I don't quote me on that, it's probably a, a very quick Google. But there, there there's cutoff criteria if, if you have hypertension, and you're overweight or uh, and you're obese. Um, you're uh, entitled to support from the diabetes prevention program. And, and most of our patients now, you know, patients in their 60s would have their smartphones. And some of some of the support provided is app based. Some of them is is, is community based. And and I know that the the whole idea with ICS or the integrated care systems is is to bring together community and, and voluntary sectors. Uh, and, and this this would be an amazing uh, opportunity uh, for this kind of uh, uh, support for patients uh, from the community heart failure nurses, from the community arrhythmia nurses, to uh, to patient support groups, to um, uh, to uh, gyms who want to um, um, a help the community. Oh no, a increase their profits. B uh, help the community uh, with discounted memberships and all that. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a huge uh, effort, uh, but. I think if we don't deal with that, we, we we have given up on medicine. I think we've given up on the NHS as well. I mean, if if we have a nationalised healthcare system, which we still do just about, um, you know, you have to push preventative medicine. You have to push preventative medicine because otherwise, what you're having to pay for is just much much bigger. It makes sense. It doesn't. If you have an insurance-based system in America, you do whatever you want because you know either you can afford the insurance or you can't, and and you can have the treatment whether or not it works or not. But I think if we are having a nationalised health service and we actually want to take that seriously, there's huge dividends to pay in prevention, um, and huge dividends to, to pay in lifestyle modification as well for disease. Um, and yet we we just don't put any don't put enough what I feel money or, or effort into it and you know even if you look at sort of cardiac rehab for coronary disease which we do have up and running which which we, we are running classes just just through that just through there 
um, you know, that pays huge dividends. There's clear evidence for that, but it just doesn't seem sexy enough um, to really take priority. And, and they got shuffled out for the COVID vaccinations and stuff where we are. And, you know, it really should be um, a mainstay of what we're doing, um, a real priority. And I, I, I certainly think it should be expanded to rhythm management as well, because and that will also pay lots of dividends in terms of hypertension, renal disease, diabetes, all these things get better with, with this. And so um, I think we really owe it to our patients to, to do it if we are going to have a nationalised health service. Agree. Do we have any other comments from our attendees? Any other questions, comments, thoughts, reflections? I was just wondering if there's not the argument for a joint link um, dietitian and arrhythmia service, for example, the patient that was presented by Ian just now. At, you know, at the time of the consultation, you have both groups of clinicians there trying to see if they could persuade the patient to um, embark on perhaps a dietary regime at the same time of the consultation of reducing the burden of arrhythmia. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think we probably Zabi and I could all agree with that. I think we should have a specific cardiac dietitian. I think we should have a specific uh, which sort of sits under the cardiac rehab. Um, I think that should be massively expanded. You know, we should be able to hugely expand our remit for this in terms of, of patients that can go in and have you know, lectures on diet, lectures on um, exercise, you know, be able to have structured exercise programs, as well as, you know, structured dietary advice, you know, it works in trials, we know it works in trials, so it should work in real life. It's just the trials have money, and we don't have the money to be able to do it. And so, um, but as, as Zabi says, you know, we could easily, you know, massively reduce our waiting list, particularly with the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, I think. Um, and, you know, where you would have to spend money in one case, you, I think you definitely save it in another. And also the unnecessary risk of going through procedures as well, you know, and every month, every few months we do our mobility and mortality meeting and there will definitely be complications associated with ablation we'll discuss next week. And of course, because it's the nature of what we do, but you know, all of that is unnecessary in many situations. I think the other thing that I would say is uh, that um, as yeah, Ian put up the slide from the exercise AF trial, is that all these studies do not mimic real life in that these patients were really closely followed up. Uh, so I can't remember the exact protocol that exercise AF used, but it was something like two weeks or three, uh, I, I, I don't know, but you know, weekly check-ins with the patient. And, and that takes a, a whole lot of money. Uh, and that's where digital solutions come in, where you, you can, uh, patients can upload their results um, to, to a portal to, for them to see how they're doing. Uh, patients can, up, uh, can, can we can import uh, data from their, their smart devices um, to, uh, as motivation. And even, you know, diet plans can be uploaded or, or uh, what I have eaten on a Sunday, uh, that kind of thing. That, requ that requires, uh, we, we know that dished out advice uh, every six months that we see those patients does not work. No. It would be, uh, it would be um, I don't know, a fraction of a percentage who would actually take that home. But constant badgering does work. And even if, I mean, if you do a back of the envelope calculation that 10 ablations cost 40,000 pounds, what could you do, even if you don't hire a person, what could you do with that 40,000 pounds for those 10 patients in terms of digital resources, in terms of uh, um, um, uh, digital supervision? Um, uh, where you wouldn't ha have to have them come in every uh, appointment in person or call them up, but just setting up a, a service where 
digital flow of information um, can happen and they can provide us data and we can provide them with, with, with support. And that's for the consultants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. level doctors to to be able to uh, push through and to believe in. And so I hope that more in 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 our generation of trainees will will recognize that. I mean, it, 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 certainly, is, I don't know, Zavi touched on in his talk, but in in the in the air studies where they try to make people lose weight, if people aren't losing weight, um, voluntarily through through dieting they will happily prescribe the meal replacement um uh, you know milkshakes or or actual food replacement you know calorie controlled food replacement so you have meals but it's controlled calories and and so if people weren't able to do that they would progress onto that so there's sort of many layers that you can involve if people um aren't sort of hitting the targets but it does require a lot more than just seeing them you know, every six months saying, have you managed to lose weight? No, okay. Have you done any exercise? No, because your knees hurt, okay. And, you know, you're just six months further down the line in terms of disease progression and you're not going to get anywhere. Any other thoughts or reflections? I think everyone's marinating on all the, the wonderful information that you guys have shared today. So I'd like to say thank you so much, really, for, for these two presentations. They've been really, truly eye-opening. And wonder, do you have any closing words that you might like to say to the group? So you go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. One, uh, it, if you want to take one message home, I think um, let get patients feel empowered to, to take control of their health. I think if they feel that what they've decided rather than it, something that's prescribed to them affects their health positively, that can make a huge change in how they view their health and, and their life. And I think mine would be badger your local people, badger your local decision makers who can look to commission these sort of services um, that we've talked about today. The evidence is completely clear. It's it's unequivocal how beneficial this can be to the patients. And there's definitely a financial case for it. So um, either that or just wait for me and Zabi to come off the top and, and, and we'll try and do it. Um, because I think we're both quite passionate about it. But um, yeah, you know, sort of do what you can with your decision makers in your own hospitals, I think would be my advice. Great, thanks for that, guys. Really, really helpful. And like I say, we'll post this video and if, if you can send me your presentations, I can share those as well um, so that we can have them all in one place. And we'll send out a note to um, all of all of our fabulous nurses who have joined us on the call today so that they can um, review the information even if they weren't here. So really want to thank everybody for joining us. And like I say, look out for some information on the June and July uh, event as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye. 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 Bye.